Eruvin 55b. One allocates carpef to every city. Allocates a carpef to every city, i.e., an area of slightly more than 70 cubits is added to the boundary of a city, and the Shabbat limit is measured from there. This is the statement of Rabbi Meir. And the sages say, they spoke of the measure of a kerpef only with regard to the space between two adjacent cities, i.e., if adjacent cities are separated by a shorter distance than that, they are considered one city. And it was stated that the Amora M disputed this issue. Rav Huna said, a kerpef is added to this city and another karpef is added to that city, so that as long as the cities are not separated by a distance of slightly more than 141 cubits, they are considered one entity. And Hayah Bar Rav said, one allocates only one karpef to the two of them. Accordingly, Rav Huna has already stated that the measure of a karpef is added to both cities in determining whether they are close enough to be considered a single entity. The Gemra answers, It is necessary for Rav Huna to state this halakha in both instances, as, had he taught it to us only here, in the case of the breached wall, one might have said that a karpef is allocated to each city only in that case because it had an aspect of permissibility from the outset. Namely, the two sections originally formed one city. But there, with regard to the two cities, say that this is not the case, and the two cities are only considered as one if they are separated by less than the measure of a single karpef. And had he taught it to us only there, with regard to the two cities, one might have said that only in that case is a carpef allocated to each city because one carpef would be too cramped for the use of both cities. But here, in the case of the breached wall, where one carpef would not be too cramped for the use of both sections, as the vacant space is inside the city, in an area that had not been used in this fashion before the wall was breached, say that this is not the case and a single karpef is sufficient. Therefore, it was necessary to state this halakha in both cases. The Gemra asks, And how much distance may there be between the imaginary bowstring and the center of the bow in a city that is shaped like a bow? Rabba Bar Rav Huna said, 2,000 cubits. Rava, son of Rabba Bar Rav Huna said, even more than 2,000 cubits. Abe said, it stands to reason in accordance with the opinion of Rava, son of Rabba Bar Rav Huna, as if one wants, he can return and go anywhere within the bow by way of the house since one can always walk to the end of the city, and from there he is permitted to walk down the line of the imaginary bowstring. He should also be permitted to walk from the middle of the bow to the bowstring, even if the distance is more than 2,000 cubits. We learned in the Mishnah, if there were remnants of walls ten handbreadths high on the outskirts of a city, they are considered part of the city, and the Shabbat limit is measured from them. The Gemra asks, What are these remnants? Rav Yehuda said, Three partitions that do not have a roof over them, which are considered part of the city despite the fact that they do not comp comprise a proper house. The dilemma was raised before the sages. In the case of two partitions that have a roof over them, what is the halakha? Is this structure also treated like a house? 
Come and hear a proof from the Tosefta. These are the structures that are included in the city's extension. A monument, Nefesh, over a grave that is four cubits by four cubits, and a bridge or a grave in which there is a residence, and a synagogue in which there is a residence for the sexton or synagogue attendant, and which is used not only for prayer services at specific times, and an idolatrous temple in which there is a residence for the priests, and similarly, horse stables and storehouses in the fields in which there is a residence, and small watch towers in the fields, and similarly, a house on an island in the sea or lake, which is located within 70 cubits of the city, all of these structures are included in the city's boundaries. And these structures are not included in the boundaries of a city. A tomb that was breached on both sides, from here to there, i.e. from one side all the way to the other. And similarly, a bridge and a grave that do not have a residence, and a synagogue that does not have a residence for the sexton, and an, idolat and an idolatrous temple that does not have a residence for the priests, and similarly stables and storehouses in fields that do not have a residence, and therefore are not used for human habitation, and a cistern, and an e elongated water ditch, and a cave, i.e. a covered cistern, and a wall, and a dovecote in the field, and similarly a house on a boat, that is not permanently located within 70 cubits of the city. All of these structures are not included in the city's boundaries. In any case, it was taught that a tomb that was breached on both sides, from here to there, is not included in the city's boundaries. What? Is this not referring to a case where there is a roof on the tomb, and the two remaining walls are not included in the city's boundaries even though they have a roof. The Gemra answers, no, the Tosefta is referring to a case where there is no roof on the tomb. The Gemra asks, a house on an island in the sea, what is it suitable for if it is not actually part of the inhabited area? Rav Papa said, it is referring to a house used to move a ship's utensils into it for storage. The Gemara raises another question with regard to the Tosefta. And is a cave on the outskirts of a city really not included in its extension? Didn't Rabbi Haya teach in a Bereta, a cave is included in its extension? Abe said, that statement applies when there is a structure built at its entrance, which is treated like a house on the outskirts of the city. The Gemara asks, if there is a structure at the entrance to the cave, why is the cave mentioned? Let him derive the halakha, that it is treated like a house, because of the structure itself. The Gemara answers, no, it is necessary only in a case where the cave serves to complete the structure, i.e., where the area of the structure and cave combined are only four by four cubits, which is the minimum size of a house. The discussion with regard to measuring Shabbat limits has been referring to a properly built city. Rav Huna said, those who dwell in huts, i.e. in thatched hovels of straw and willow branches, are not considered inhabitants of a city. Therefore, one measures the Shabbat limit for them only from the entrance to their homes. The huts are not combined together and considered a city. Rav Hizda raised an objection. The Torah states with regard to the Jewish people in the desert, and they pitched by the Jordan from Beit 
Hayeshemot to Avel Shittim in the plains of Moab. Numbers 33:49. And Rabbi Bar Bar Hana said that Rabbi Yohanan said, I myself saw that place, and it is three parasangs, parsa, the equivalent of twelve mil, by three parasangs. And it was taught in a bereta, when they would defecate in the wilderness, they would not defecate in front of themselves, i.e., in front of the camp, and not to their sides, due to respect for the divine presence. Rather, they would do so behind the camp. This indicates that even on Shabbat, when people need to defecate, they would walk the entire length of the camp, which was considerably longer than 2,000 cubits, which equals one mil. It is apparent that the encampment of the Jewish people was considered to be a city, despite the fact that it was composed of tents alone. How, then, did Rav Huna say that those who live in huts are not considered city dwellers? Rava said to him, The banners of the desert, you say. Are you citing a proof from the practice of the Jewish people as they traveled through the desert according to their tribal banners? Since it is written with regard to them, According to the commandment of the Lord, they remained encamped, and according to the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. Numbers 9.20 It was considered as though it were a permanent residence for them. A camp that is established in accordance with the word of God is regarded as a permanent settlement. Rav Hinana bar Rav Kahana said that Rav Ashi said, If there are three courtyards of two properly built houses among a settlement of huts, they have been established as a permanent settlement, and the Shabbat limit is measured from the edge of the settlement. On the topic of people who dwell in huts, Rav Yehuda said that Rav said, Those who dwell in huts, such as shepherds, who pass from one place to another and stay in a single location for only a brief period, and desert travelers, their lives are not lives, i.e., they lead extremely difficult lives, and their wives and children are not always their own, as will be explained below. That was also taught in the following Bereta. Eliezer of Biriah says, Those who dwell in huts are like those who dwell in graves. And with regard to one who marries their daughters, the verse says, Cursed be he who sleeps with any manner of beast. Deuteronomy 27, 21. The Gemara asks, What is the reason for this harsh statement with regard to the daughters of those who dwell in huts or travel in deserts. Ulla said, They do not have bathhouses, and therefore the men have to walk a significant distance in order to bathe. There is concern that while they are away, their wives commit adultery, and that consequently their children are not really their own. And Rabbi Yohanan said, because they sense when one another's they sense when one another immerses. Similarly to the men, the woman must walk a significant distance in order to immerse in a ritual bath. Since the settlement is very small, and everyone knows when the women go to immerse, it is possible for an unscrupulous man to use this information to engage in adulterous relations with them by following them and taking advantage of the fact that they are alone. The Gemara asks, What is the practical difference between the explanations of Allah and Rabbi Yohanan? The Gemara explains, There is a practical difference between them in a case where there is a river that is adjacent to the house.
and it is suitable for immersion but not for bathing. Consequently, the women would not have to go far to immerse themselves, but the men would still have to walk a significant distance in order to bathe. Having mentioned various places of residence, the Gemara cites what Rav Huna said, Any city that does not have vegetables, a Torah scholar is not permitted to dwell there for health reasons. The Gemara asks, Is that to say that vegetables are beneficial to a person's health? Wasn't it taught in a Bereta? Three things increase one's waist. Bend his stature and remove one five-hundredth of the light of a person's eyes. They are 